with my guest today, Glenn Swanson, space NASA and Star Trek historian and author. Today on episode, wow, 312 of Trekland Tuesdays Live with me, Dr. Trek, Larry Nemechek, coming at you once again through Portal 47 via Trekland Treks, here for some clarity, sanity, and the big picture in all things Star Trek, or at least in many things Star Trek anyway. I'm so glad to see everybody again. I'm going to get off on my topic today, and my topic today is a guest. That's always exciting. This, this year, we've been having guests on. I am so excited to have our guest today. Again, I first became aware of Glenn. Um, Glenn Swanson is our guest today. And I first became aware of him through the year of his research that he was posting on all the socials for the 55th anniversary of the AMT model kit, which, yes, was historic, not just for Star Trek World, for Star Trek's production, because it enabled the building of the Galileo and vice versa, but also because of what it meant in even the model, the model plastic kit industry. So um, it's been fun to watch Glenn and, and meet him from afar. Today's the first time we've talked actually live since we're coming at it from different ends of the country. But he's got a project going right now um, that's exciting, and he's been giving little teases and hints about it online too. So why don't I stop talking and, and bring him in right now? So, Glenn Swanson, welcome to Trek One Tuesdays Live, and I'm so glad we finally got to meet, and I'm so glad to maybe give a signal boost to this latest uh, project of yours. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm delighted to finally see you and hear you in person, uh, Larry, <laughs> through, through the <laughs> wonders of the internet. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, thank, Well, I tried to uh, give a send-up. Let me just say, before the what I've found out since, and what you talk about is... Uh, Let's just do this. There you are. And I know you say, well, this is a few years ago, but I like this shot. This is your picture, but you've got all the, uh, I've got the, I've got the logo here, but this is, um, this is uh, some of your past science writing. You've been writing in NASA history, space history. You talk about having researched a lot for, for this new book that you're, that you're writing. Let's just bring that in. Inspired Enterprise, which is a great time. The, uh, how NASA, Smithsonian and others, Help launch Star Trek, but you've got this background working in NASA, space history, flight history. Um, I, I guess you've got that as an interest. That was career. So why don't you mm -hmm. tell everybody what you did before you got into this? Because I totally see the segue from then to now. Right. Well, I've always been interested in the history of space flight. My, my formal academic background is as a historian. My undergraduate and graduate degrees are in, in history, and um, I have written a lot in the past. I well, founded a magazine called Quest and that one picture that you saw there, mm -hmm. which just last year celebrated its 30th anniversary of publication, which is really rare for a print magazine to still be around as a print magazine for 30 years. It's a quarterly publication on the history of space flight. Uh, for quite a while, it was the world's only publication that was focused on that. And I did that uh, in the 90s before uh, starting work as the historian at the Johnson Space Center uh, in 1998. Mm -hmm. So I've always been interested uh, in the history of spaceflight and um, even longer interested in Star Trek. <laughs> so my, my interest in Star Trek, um, you know, basically got me going to uh, interested in space, in, in the history of space fact, as well as the history of uh -huh. science fiction. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm just kind of the other way around. I, I was a kid that was fascinated with the NASA program. Well, I was a kid when the moon landings were happening. So. You know, I came to Star Trek from from that world, but that's what I loved about Star Trek because it tried to be based in reality and uh, not just the science, but the historical timeline. It wasn't not that I looked down on like I was too snooty to enjoy Star Wars, but eventually it, it was subconscious, and I realized that the reason I enjoyed Star Trek. I, whenever Kirk would have a speech, when he would run through history, and he would start off with Napoleon and Hitler and wind up with Lee Kwan and Colonel Green or whatever. And it was like that was just reinforcing that their future was us, you know, yeah, and right. uh, and so historically and also so, which were my two big nerd interests, I guess, history and science. And I just, you know, it was a sweet spot. So right. that's that's um, um, and I appreciated the fact that that uh, that they, there was always a science visor on Star Trek and, you know. Right. Right. Uh, but I, but I love this picture of you because it totally shows your resume here, your 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 CV, as it were. Yeah, the top book uh, is Before This Decade Is Out, the one with the picture mm -hmm. of uh, the uh, Apollo. That's Apollo 12 on the launch pad, actually. 
And uh, <laughs> I published that when I was working with NASA and as a civil servant. So it was a published as a NASA book. And mm. um, um, we had some money at the time to fund a project uh, to do some uh, research. And I, I actually started at the Johnson Space Center as their oral historian. Uh, they had oh. started a new oral history program where they were trying to capture uh, the histories of a lot of the individuals that worked mm -hmm. on, this, on the Apollo program because they were getting older. I mean, 1999, um, you know, you're, you're suddenly at the 30th anniversary of the first right. Apollo lunar landing. So these people were getting up there and they realized uh, that the astronauts, their stories have been told and retold almost to the point of mythology. But a lot of the half a million people that worked at the peak of the Apollo program, their story has not been told. And so I was very interested in that because I was, you know, I've, oh, yeah. I grew up and you, I'm sure, have grown up on the on the Carrying the Fire by Michael Collins and Return to Earth by Buzz Aldrin and a lot of the books that were written by the astronauts, Countdown yeah. by Frank Borman. Uh, see, so you're going to the source material of the books. Now, yeah. I'm, I'm going to admit that I haven't read a lot of the books, but I will, you know, uh, The Right Stuff, which wasn't an astronaut mm -hmm. book, but it was the documenting that for the first time but you know by the time you're talking about 1999 well what apollo 13 had been out and that was glorifying you know the problem solvers and the right. work the problem peoplers you yeah. know and in yeah. csc to uh, not csc what is it to ox i've just gone blank oh, uh, uh, switch to ox <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> right <laughs> or say cvs to ox no not yeah. but you know what i mean yes someone in the chat will pop in with the right acronym right right um, there's little models of that switch those toggle switch i've seen yeah <laughs> but but Apollo 13 really, you know, s shared the spotlight and showed that that was a, that was a success. Well, it was always they were always a success due to all those faceless people in the room, mm -hmm. whether, you know, and then Apollo 13, you start with, you know, Gene Krantz on down and especially everybody else around um, and the simulator people and all of that. So that's that that time was very ripe to the world to suddenly wake up, you know, and then we progress along to the fact that you've got the hidden fi hidden figures, women who were fighting on two fronts, who were saving the space program in the early days mm -hmm. and weren't getting recognition at all. So I, I you know, I'm just a sucker for a good space movie. Um, <laughs> I don't always have the time to read through the books, but I'm so thrilled to have all those astronauts and all their memoirs uh, right. doing that. But I think some of the, some of the main, that's it, the main stage, the main folks behind the scenes at NASA um, have done some books too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it, you know, it's, it's, um, it kind of trained me in a way to look at some of the lesser people, uh, you know, not only in the Apollo program, but then when it comes to Star Trek, because we know, you know, the two genes, mm -hmm. the Gene Kuhn and Gene Roddenberry, but we really know beyond hearing their names, for example, Harvey Lind, you mentioned him as the first uh, technical advisor for Star Trek. We run across his name, of course, in making a Star Trek oh, yeah. and we hear about him, but do we really know who he was? You know, do we even know what he looks like? That was what was intriguing to me too, because I'd searched high and low for even a photograph of him. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. this this individual who worked on Star Trek and influenced it, and his fingerprints are all over it, especially mm -hmm. during the first season. And uh, was documented early in the making of Star Trek. Gene talks mm -hmm. about his Harvey P. Lynn memories. Right. But who so his name's been out there, but you're absolutely right. I never, I just thought, well, that's the 60s. He's long past. Mm -hmm. We'll never be able to, you know, but you're right. Kidding faces. It's hard going back. It's hard sometimes even to find in even to the nineties now to get pictures of folks, but yeah. we didn't live on a, we didn't live on a camera on your phone in your pocket era. Right. So, so that's one of the things, you know, that I, I, I pursue uh, in depth with my um, new book is to look at some of these other individuals names, some of the names that we will be familiar with, but others that we won't be uh, familiar with and their influence and impact on the creation of Star Trek. And when I say, uh, Star Trek, the original series, um, because there's been a lot of books uh, written since then, of course, about the mm -hmm. influence that Star Trek has had on NASA and the astronauts, uh, you know, through the multiple series. But I'm focusing just on this early germination period, you know, when everything was starting to come together in Gene's mind and creating the original series. What kind of influence has NASA had and the Smithsonian right. and some of these other individuals um, in the series that we that we really don't know much about? Well, even uh, even your cover here. I know this photo. I mean, I couldn't tell you like the verse and day chapter and all, but um, that's that's Gene and uh, D and Jimmy yep. visiting one of the. I, I don't know if they're at Edwards or they're at because yeah, they're at Edwards Airport. Airport. So they're not at JPL. So no, no they're at, they're actually at the Dryden Flight Research Center now. Okay. They are 
uh, Center um, uh, at Edwards Air Force Base in California. And that photograph, um, although if you look really close, and some uh, individuals would be quite perceptive, it's not exactly the same photo that appears in Making of Star Trek uh, in Winfield's book, because um, DeForest Kelly is smiling. <laughs> he's not smiling in the one in, in Winfield's book. In fact, he's looking straight at the camera and probably thinking, Man, I wish I was anywhere else but here. <laughs> but meanwhile, uh, you know, Jimmy Doohan, um, mm -hmm. the engineer, uh, is fascinated. And, of course, Gene Roddenberry is front and center next to the NASA meatball. And if you look really close, um, that uh, experimental aircraft that they are um, standing in front of is the uh, HL-10, uh, which flew um, uh, multiple times to test um, basically wingless flight. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, spacecraft at the time, and that's all in the hangar uh, out at Dryden. And then the tall gentleman on the left, I don't know who he is. Um, I've got some other shots in the sequence of photos that were taken that I found um, where I see his face, but um, I, I have not been able to track down. I'm sure he was someone mm -hmm. up there because he's wearing a suit, uh, most likely their, uh, their uh, post or whatever uh, for when they visited uh, this facility in April of... Um, Sure. 1960s. Somebody in PR or public relations or liaison or something, celebrity, mm -hmm. whoever, whoever was the guy stuck with giving tours to the celebrity guest visitors or whatever. Right. Yeah. Right. But that photo captures, you know, um, in essence, you know, uh, yeah, it's yeah. what, I'm, what I'm talking about because it includes NASA. It was originally, mm -hmm. of course, in Winfield's book. And then there were uh, other photos in that sequence, too, that uh, will be included in the book that I will share. And then the story, of course, of why they were there. Yeah. Well, uh, you sent me a couple of other, uh, let me see, a couple of other images here. Um, now this was, well, this is kind of like a compilation boom. Um, so there's your cover. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and uh, I don't know if, yeah. So you know, I mentioned the 55, which I loved. I love, I love the, I'd never seen the photo of talking about the Enterprise model kit on its 50th anniversary. The picture you've got of Dee and Carolyn Kelly, and he's got the model kit, like the pieces and in the instructions. On the floor sheet. with his wife, yeah. Yeah, on the floor with Carolyn. That's just, an, I just love that. I was like, oh my God, I'd never seen that until you dug it out. Maybe I yeah. couldn't. Yeah. It, it, it's one that's, in fact, I've, I've been trying to find the source. It most likely was a publicity shot, mm -hmm. maybe taken for AMT, but I haven't been able to find the original of the source. It was, uh, to give credit where credit's due, it was found out on the web. Um, and it's, there's a digitized copy of it out there. Um, I tried to clean it up as best as I could. It was originally in black and white. Um, but it's, it's wonderful because you can see it's clearly staged. They're on the floor, most likely in their house. And, uh, he's, you know, fuddling around trying to put this thing together. And of course his wife is next to him there, you know, they're, uh, all, in show model. they're all in show model poses for you. Right. You exactly. So it, so. and it was posed, but I would love to know the full story on it. And I haven't been able to, uh, to find it. So that's one of those things I'm hoping once the book gets out as well, that when people see some of these mm -hmm. you know, not so common images and some that are quite rare, um, that they might be able to come forward. The problem is a lot of these people are getting old or are, are old if they're still alive. Well, are they long past, right? Yeah, I've, I've already encountered that when I've interviewed some of the individuals for my book. Um, I interviewed Callum DeForest, who was in his I 90s. was so jealous. I saw that. And like, yeah. what, a year, just a little over a year before he passed. Yeah, and, and the folks don't know who he was. Uh, Callum DeForest uh, started uh, DeForest Research, and they were uh, basically a script checker. Mm -hmm. They would go through the scripts uh, and they did all of the Star Trek ones uh, to look for facts and look for names and clearance so that, you know, the studios wouldn't uh, be sued um, for using someone's name that, you know, right. in some fashion and, and just ruin their career or, or whatever. And Kellen went through all the scripts. So his, his influence, uh, not only him, but Joan Pierce who worked right. for uh, Kellen before she started her own um, script clearance firm, and she well, passed away as well, but yeah, uh, his yeah, influence is quite heavy yeah, in, in the series, also. Yeah, he's mentioned. He again, again, another name that's mentioned all through the making of that yep. we all grew up with, and then I thought had passed, but was still around. But yes, he handed off to Joan, and then Joan did the same. Did all that checking, and you know, in the years they didn't have a science advisor, they provided a lot of science tech. And this was, you know, before I've had. Um, oh my goodness, I've gone blank on his name. 
but one of their other employees, they both passed, but another gentleman that worked with them who's still with us and was a Portal 47 guest one month and talked oh. about that whole world. Mm -hmm. But yeah, before the internet, you just had to have tons of all purpose books, but you had to have like really specific books or be able to get to them. And they provided that service and they'd get the memo on the draft scripts and the stories and, and drafts. And yeah, and Joan Pierce continued that. So I, anyway, I saw your picture with you and Kellen DeForest from, from uh, what, th like 2019. And I was like, right. oh my God. I just These interviewed him forever. in the Christmas of 2019. And then sadly um, he passed away uh, a year after that uh, due to complications from COVID. Uh, but I was really fortunate to be able to mm -hmm. see him. He's a wonderful gentleman. I've since, you know, corresponded with his family and, you know, talked with them as part of my interview process as well. But Kellen was extremely sharp, you know, still, you know, Yale educated historian, which is also an interesting um, part of my thesis in my book is, you know, you have Harvey Lynn trained as a, as a uh, engineer, and then you have Kellen DeForest trained as a historian. So both of these individuals, you know, as you mentioned mm -hmm. and readers know, I are mentioned in the making of Star Trek throughout had influence in the original series. And it was great. You have a historian as well as a, a, an engineer or scientist. Yeah. Well, so I mean, this was the rare shot of the bird of prey that I love because you can see the tail finning, which I think Mike McMaster and his blueprints had that. Some they had access to this photo, but a lot of people widely didn't know the uh, here. The yeah, that, uh, those were a couple yeah. of trims of all places I found on the internet. Uh, most likely, they were Lincoln Enterprises trims um, that you mm -hmm. know that were circulating around, but I had never seen them before. They were pretty rare. And so, you know, I'm scrutinizing them closely to look for any details that you can find. And um, you know, I've enlarged them. And those are a couple of the items that I offer as, as uh, premiums for, you know, different funding levels. But yeah, they're really cool. Watch Hang's amazing uh, model. Uh, very little is known about it. Very little, you know, has been seen uh, so that mm -hmm. we can really grab images from it. But on those two shots, you can see kind of the pattern on the tail as well as the trailing edge of the wings. Right. Um, and then through Matt Cushman's excellent research, along with his brother, Chris, yeah. um, it's a little uh, bigger. Yeah. Cushman brothers, the Cushman cutaways, um, they've found more information about how the uh, bird of prey pattern was originally painted blue, which was intriguing. Uh, and they wrote oh, yeah. about that in an uh, issue of, uh, I think it was Trek Magazine or something, one of the publications not too long, just a year or two ago. And, and so that was enlightening as well. <laughs> I put the, and, and hypotheticalizing that uh, that they had to change it from blue to orange because blue on blue screen would right would bleed out. Yeah, the right. union painters involved, although they should have known. I you know don't know the full story on that, but it would be interesting to uh, you know um, find more close up shots to see some of the uh, the painting patterns and and maybe if there were any photos taken of it yep. when it was blue. <laughs> same <laughs> same reason that the first post silver suit for Seven of Nine was blue and only lasted one episode. They thought, well, how stupid is this? They put her in astrometrics with all the blue screen and went, well, this is stupid. <laughs> and these are union uh, folks working on this. It seems yeah, like they yeah, yeah. know, right? <laughs> uh, Bob Blackman, you should have known, right. So uh, so this was the the uh, fully gold, uh, I know what this logo is. It's from the pilots. And it's yeah, from the oh yeah. Suit. Yep. I didn't yeah, know if there was a special reason you had it included here. Yeah, the, the, the globe and wreaths uh, is mentioned in some of the correspondence um, that I found at the Roddenberry Archives, which, you know, folks can, can access at UCLA. It's a wonderful resource. If mm -hmm. any of your followers out there have not had a chance to go out there, Mark Cushman uses that extensively uh, in his, you know, uh, epic series, um, These Are the Voyages, his three-volume set. But it's a wonderful resource to use, and I've made multiple trips there, and uh, I found the original artwork, or or a very clean silk screening of it. I think it was a it was a silk screen print that they used. Mm -hmm. uh, they just printed it on glossy paper uh, for reference, and there were multiple copies of it. So I had that scanned. Uh, they will offer scan services and everything for images for a fee, and then reproduce that here because it was the cleanest original artwork uh, that I could see from that emblem. And then of course finding the documentation and the correspondence and the memos that gene had because he was considering you know using that as the design or variations of it this was you know early on when they were trying to look for some kind of identity for for the series for the crew and this yeah. was one of them that was being considered so you know that's the one you see on the cups you see it on clipboards you see it on the uh um the well, 
yeah, the pockets of the cover. Yeah, boy yeah, yeah it, and, it's uh, yeah. there everywhere. Um, and so, you know, historically, I had to include that as well, so people could uh, see copies of that. And we have available of it um, stickers, you know, uh, printed up on clear stickers, so oh, okay. people can apply these to. If you can find some of those old metal clipboards. Uh, you can stick it on there. It's about the right size. It's a little bit too big for the cups, but I have seen some people take the the classic um, styrofoam mm -hmm. cups, which were painted or colored gray with that little black trim around there, and then apply this very carefully. It's a little oversized for that, um, but um, but yeah, it's 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 still the yeah. image. Just scan it down a little bit and put right. it on your own for backing. Yeah, Come make on. your own. You know, my God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> People whip out incredible CG models now and incredible cosplays. I think they can, hopefully they can shrink down a sticker and, and all that. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let's talk about, um, so this is a mock-up? Is this what you're... you're right. We, we wanted yeah. to put a mock-up of the book. Um, in place because we wanted to show people, you know, that it is a book when we're referencing it for some of the different levels. So it, it's not set in stone as far as the finish, you know, what the finish cover will look like the hard cover. But uh, I do have a contract in place with the publisher. Uh, I have to turn everything over this fall. I've been working on it for the past year as far as writing, writing the book. And then once it gets in the hands of the publisher, um, I'm pretty sure it'll, it won't be out this year unless they're super, super fast. It'll most likely be out next year. Uh, the finished book, but it will be hardbound. Um, it will be uh, probably around 300 and some pages in length. It'll have a couple of photo insert sections um, that will have photographs in it. And so we just kind of staged a, a tentative cover to, to show it as mm -hmm. what it looks like. The little Trek logo that you see in the lower left hand. I was going to ask corner. you about that. Yeah. yeah. That was a fun one um, because that's actually done by George White who was an artist, and I ran across that uh, all maybe four or five years ago on the internet, uh, and originally it said NASA uh, in there. <laughs> and I really love the NASA uh, you know, logo that was in there, because it's it's the old meatball, you know, the NASA worm, that, or meatball mm -hmm. that you see in the black and white photo, the original emblem of the of NASA. Uh -huh. And then it's, uh, you know, it's a mashup of, of Star Trek, of course, uh, the original series, although he's done one also, the original artist uh, with the uh, the refit enterprise, you know, swooping off as well. And I said, ah, could you pop in the the classic one in there because that's what I focused on. Do that. So he yeah, do that. that. And yeah. and people retconning that the the red here is the delta. Yeah. Is the delta that turns into the Starfleet delta. Mike and right. Mike and Doug have kind of played with that. Yeah. Angle. And the um, I I wanted to keep it with NASA um, because of the NASA connections. And I actually, you know, approached NASA mm -hmm. and asked for permissions to use that. And they said, no, I'm afraid it's too similar, you know, to, uh, to NASA. These people might confuse it, you know, with the actual agency mm -hmm. and everything. And I understand that. So I went back and had Carl Tate, uh, who's worked with me tremendously and, and it's a graphic designer on the book as well. And he went back with George's permission and we tweaked it a little bit, um, to replace NASA with Trek, but Trek is in the font of NASA, the you know the logo for the for the mm -hmm. word for NASA, and then we uh, tweaked the stars a little bit, worked on the vector, the orbit, so that you know kind of did the for all mankind thing, uh, which is you know there I don't know if you've seen for all mankind, but mm -hmm. another mm -hmm. series on, uh, which is really nice where they they have NASA emblems, the NASA worm, you know the red worm, but they've tweaked it a little yeah. bit, uh, courtesy of Mike Kuda. Um, so that it doesn't quite look, you know, exactly the same, right. but we've done the same thing with that. Well, they're, they're, it's so future projected that they immediately right. leave our current times behind anyway. So yeah. it's all, they, they so might that little well icon kind of encapsulates, you know, the connection with NASA, the connection with Star Trek, mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and it makes it a little, you know, to, to, to distill down, you know, what I'm doing in a yeah. single graphic, if I wanted to do a patch or a sticker or something like that to, uh, to help promote the book easily uh, that little graphic uh, kind of says it all so that's that's yeah. what we did with that and that's offered as kind of a premium in our kickstarter as well we have a little vinyl sticker that we we produce on that let me see well um let me uh i, I oh and that I... picture of me uh in the back there yeah. um, some of your readers or followers most likely have taken the paramount tour I did that in 2019. Uh, I did a lot of my research in 2019. It was almost as if some little spirit or ghost, or maybe the ghost of Gene Roddenberry, <laughs> was 
was send it out. Get all of your work done in 2019 because 2020 <laughs> right. is going to be really bad. <laughs> Not so a big year for travel. research. Right. Yeah, I traveled all over the or, place. Or um, live research, anyway. Yeah. yeah, I did a lot of research. And so um, in, in the Christmas of 2019, December 29, which was like my third trip, I think, to the L.A. area or whatever. So I have relatives out there. Mm -hmm. um, I went and did the Paramount tour and uh, folks can do that. They have a couple different levels, but it's a really nice tour. And um, yeah. they take you, you know, to the different sound stages. And then our, our host said, hey, you know, what are you interested in? Because they they were really small groups. And I said, well, I'm interested in Star Trek, the original series. And he says, well, let me take you to, you know, stage 31, which was originally stage, what, 9 and 10, 10 and 11? Yeah. Uh, uh, nine and ten, yes. Nine and ten, yeah. The the two sound stages that they used for the original series, and so he took me over there. We couldn't go inside, but um, there's these plaques that are really nice, and they have those on the sound stages of all of them that Paramount put up that list all of the mm -hmm. films and television you know shows that were filmed in there. And so that's and he took my picture next to it. So that was and those have just been up since since the I say the Viacom divorce, but when the studio changed over and the new attitude came in about they. They had discouraged, they only did tours grudgingly in the old days, which basically was all the original, like the Berman era and well before. But when tourism became a thing, they actually were snooty about it and tried to distance them. Like they always would point to Universal. We're, we're a working studio, not a theme park. You know? <laughs> and there were little, now that, that totally ignores the fact that Warner Brothers had an act, not only had an active museum, but it had like a real <laughs> professional curator who right. curated their archives and they took it seriously as a, St Paramount had an archivist, but they didn't, they, uh, it was, it fell by the wayside a lot. And there was nothing really, they'd made attempts to have publicly uh, public facilities, but that all changed hmm. with the new administration. So a, these plaques went up at all the stages because Warner's was doing that. And it was kind of like, Oh, well, we need to do that too. Hmm. But also they, they carry, they have a museum now. It's something as simple as bringing pro including Star Trek from the Kelvin movies but bringing props and set pieces and graphics over and they have a little museum now that they can dump tours into, but they, they totally beefed up the tour situation. So, you know, good on you for experiencing. I mean, I do, I offer that as an option on the tours that I do as a stop and, you know, give my own thing, but um, cool. they've, they've totally beefed up what you can do now. And they had some things wrong on the, they got the whole Desi Lou numbers later Paramount numbers confused. And they had like, stage not the normal stage nine where next gen and ds9 and voyager were mm -hmm. uh, they had that stage nine listed with the original series and i was like okay someone needs to like double check because you know stage right. nine is, is is over in the 30s over there like where you are here yeah yeah they renumbered the stages when they added the desi Lu stages in but anyway we're in the weeds here but um <laughs> Yeah, it's, yeah, you're right. I'm so glad you got out. And that's when you talked to Kellum before, as you said. Right. That same uh, that same time in December is when I went out and yeah. visited him and interviewed him and, um, you know, had a chance to to, to mm -hmm. get his experiences. And he, it's funny. He had a copy of uh, Inside Star Trek, you know, the the, the book that uh, Justman and Solo put out mm -hmm. in the late 90s, I think it was. Yeah, 96. Which, yeah. Which, you know, has some issues, but it's a, it's a really good launching point for me as far as some of the research. Mm -hmm. There's some things in there that you can use to start your research. I, I, I wouldn't quote a lot of it verbatim because it does have some issues, but um, especially from Herb Solo, but yes. yeah, it, it's a good, how should we say memories get a little fuzzy over years? <laughs> a little, well, there's a little bit of feather nesting. Yeah. You know, I, read, I, I actually met Bob Justin for the first time when I was working on the next generation companion in, in like 15 nanoseconds. It felt like, like I had to get it done quickly and he had already, we sat down and did this. I mean, I met him and we sat and talked for four, I have four hours of tape. And then we went back, back and he printed out memos that he had done from next gen. Mm -hmm. Right. Still had those but early, you know, 1987 era, 86. But I said something about why aren't you doing a book? And he said, Oh, well, I've tried to sell a book, but they want me to write the whole thing because it's Star Trek and it's licensed. It's like, he's thinking it would be like normal book world. <laughs> and he said, well, they want me to write the whole thing before they tell me whether they'll pay me for it or not, <laughs> which I totally get. Yeah. And I was right. learning that was the licensing world. Like it's Star Trek. It's going to sell a million copies. If it could be crap and you're going to sell a million copies. So, and we'll pay you 27 cents a copy for it or something ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But I thought, you know, but I'm thinking, well, this is, you know, he's, he's one of your guiding lights and voices. How, you know, how insufferably rude to do that. 
so I felt bad about it. But then here comes, you know, two or three years later, four or five years later, and I hear the news that, well, he's co-partnered with Herb. And I, the whole thing about, I, and I didn't mean to get off on this, but the whole thing about, um, you know, how Herb helped Gene, who was not a salesman, and how Herb basically did get, if you give him any kudos, he got Star Trek on the air. He was the salesman. He slicked his way past all the, you know, he got him to Desi Lu and then got him through the LA NBC people and the New York NBC people, all those names, mm -hmm. and got it sold. And he talks about that. But to really, it, but it's him talking about, well, we just did this and I just pushed. But to stand back and go, my God, like Gene was the, you know, the mumbly, slovenly kind of, you know, not the big pushy salesman. And it's Herb that got it over the finish line and got it sold. And when you think about that, you totally get what we were just saying about, <laughs> well, you know what? Here's, you know, he's going to sell himself basically. But on the other hand, he's the one that got Bob's memories into book form and sold because they basically co-write the book. But I know it's Herb Solo that sold that book as well. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. he also sold, they did an art book for the original series that now a lot of people don't really remember, but it, it's out. It's first time they did an art book right. on the original series. But and he then, did a deal. And got that out there and got Bob on. So when I read the Inside Star Trek book now, and I know that Herb is kind of feathering his nest a little bit there, it's at least got Bob's – and, you know, Bob's off on a couple of things too, but I totally trust the machine mind of Bob Justman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? Um, and that's what you're saying. Yeah, Bob Justman, I would love to have met him. He's one of the individuals, along with uh, Gene Kuhn, that if I could go back in time, a little time machine mm -hmm. or whatever, I would, I would really love to – to speak with them, you know, in person and talk with them. Uh, Gene Kuhn especially is one of the, you know, uh, people that we know so much about um, as far as his influence on Star Trek, but know so very little about the, you know, right. the person himself. And I'm hoping through my Kickstarter, uh, because one of my goals is to fund uh, uh, some additional research in archives, is to fund my tr a trip to University of Wyoming. Uh, which is where the Gino Kuhn papers are. And you might say, how in the world did they end up in a state that has fewer population than most cities? <laughs> you know, it's amazing. How did they, <laughs> how they, how did all this stuff come out here? Mm -hmm. And if you just Google their American Heritage Center that they have there, um, they have an amazing collection, not only of Kuhn's papers, but um, uh, Sam Peebles. Uh, and, 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 uh, and repeat where that is again? Uh, Peebles. No, I mean the collection. Oh, the collection. It's uh it's 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 basically at the American Heritage Center at the University of Wyoming. They have this mm -hmm. huge collection that I think is is one of these diamonds in a rough. Uh, because I've you know I've spoken to some others too, and they said, What? There's a collection out there? Um, and I first ran across it while doing research in Variety and old back issues of Variety magazine, which has a lot of uh, you know, good information. And um there was um some articles um, in the 1960s and 70s about how they were quite aggressive in gathering collections from old Hollywood individuals, you know, people that um, had passed on or were in their last days and they were looking to get rid of their paper. And so um, they acquired a considerable number of collections. And, you know, they got the Forrest Ackerman, you know, collections, not not the, uh, the artifacts, but the paper, you know, right. uh, pictures and documents and magazines and things that the he would mention. Right. So, well, but see, the, you know, it takes, as as uh, what as Kirk or Edith Keeler once said, it only takes one person with a vision, mm -hmm. you know, or maybe Mary, maybe Mirror Spock, but um, way before a lot of people, people were still throwing stuff away. The studios were the worst. Like for all the fans who dared to go dumpster dive or steal stuff, who were thieves, the st until the last twenty years, the studios, you know, it was just trash. And it was very, it's like the postal service. If there were errors in like the biplane error, I'm going to get weird here, but you brought it out of me, Glenn. But you know, the, the postal services, the old post office's attitude, if there was a misprint after the inverted Jenny biplane stamp became a collector's item, they had this attitude that if there was a mistake in the printing, they wanted it destroyed because they didn't want to create instant collectibles that way from yeah. a mistake. Yeah. It was insane. And right. the studios, not exactly, but still the same attitude. It was like, well, this stuff shouldn't become collectible. You know, this is, we should, you know, nothing, none of this should become elitist or collectible. It's all garbage and it's our property and we're done with it. And that attitude is so, it's like, what? So 
I I remember Richard Arnold telling me the day he heard wind, you know, glass crashing massively, and he ran out in the alley at the lot at Paramount, and they were cleaning out old glass mat paintings, including oh, yeah. oh. including some of the and they were like upstairs stored, mm. and they were just throwing them out a window and letting them crash oh. into a dumpster. Yeah, and they were so this this you know like little Nazi attitude about it's almost like if we if we're not going to use it nobody can have it. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah. And well, it's sad that that, that attitude you know even prevails to some degree today. You know, you probably recall yeah. Warner Brothers recently with our movie posters. You know, um, you know stuff that's the. It's just it boggles the mind on some of the uh, mm -hmm. the heritage that's still you know. I mean, thankfully, a lot of that shit. But I say with the studio attitude at Paramount was, uh, you know, oh, we have to put up with tourists. Like they're going to come. We have to put up with them. Right. And I mean, that's all. A lot of this has changed in the last 10, 15. Well, for one thing, it's like everybody needs revenue. <laughs> like, right. Nothing else. Just go make money off the stuff yeah. or get the PR out of donating it, if not auctioning it and selling it or whatever. Anyway, anyway, I want to I want to make sure and let people I, I think this is I rarely do this, but I'm going to try. I want to uh, let people boom. See your Kickstarter here. I want to take some questions. I think we got a few questions in the chat. I'm going to back backtrack. So you're, it looks like you're a little behind your goal, but, but, uh, it's popped up. I mean, I started, I don't want to take all the credit here, but the last 24, 38 hours or something I wanted to, I, I think it's edged up a little bit in the last day. So maybe we'll get some more attention and I know, hope I, I even put it in virtual. I need, I even put a new funding level out there. I call it the dilithium level because, uh, the, oh, there's, okay. there's a couple of items that I have in my collection and I'm, I'm really trying to, you know, gather funds to try mm -hmm. to get the book going. And so if you look at the dilithium level, you will see a original drawing of the Enterprise uh, that Matt Jeffries did, one of the conceptual versions yeah. for the original series. Now, it is... Yeah. Uh, it Let is me just say real quick, here's your... You were talking about getting making an effort to get faces for the names. Yep. And yep. All those that, things I talk yeah. about in the book. Um, there's uh, from left to right. I don't know if you can see it, but that's uh, that's Kellum DeForest in his uh, uh, mm -hmm. main library uh, mm -hmm. on the set. Of Paramount Studios, actually, mm -hmm. you know, because that was one of the he got free rent uh, by by me being able to essentially uh, take over the old RKO ar archives that they had there, and uh, so that's him there in that in that original archive. That's Joan Pierce to the right, mm -hmm. um, and that's Fred Durant the third um, uh, next to her, who um, has a critical role in the Smithsonian's contribution. Right uh, to the uh, to the influence of Star Trek, and it what oh uh, was involved with getting the filming model, and yeah, all the yeah. other Star Trek and the oh, yeah. yeah. seven and the, or the this battle story film. is is fascinating. Um, <laughs> I don't want to re reveal all of it, but but that right. the, the connection with the Smithsonian to the original series. If people are wondering how did the how did the eleven foot miniature get there and who was responsible for that, that's all covered in my. Uh, in my book in depth of how, how they actually acquired that and, and things that, that occurred prior to that um, because they didn't actually get that until 1974 when nobody wanted it. When, right. you know, right. Paramount's like, sure, well, Star Trek, what's that? I mean, there was a cartoon that's out around that time, but you know, and my kids watch it in syndication, but that's, well, it's no asset that's currently active. So sure. When I, yeah. When I had the, when we had the communicator <laughs> magazine, I had, we had the, the guy who engineered, who facilitated this, do you know the story about the Enterprise model fresh from cancellation when no one cared about anything? It was all radioactive and like if you touch it, it'll lose money. That was the attitude. Yeah. But they had a in Arizona, either at the University of Arizona, Arizona State, had a display. They actually borrowed and paid for the shipping for the 11 foot model and some other pieces to be on display. You know, for the public. And it was a huge this is like 1970. Well, yeah, was it wasn't in Arizona. Yeah, that wasn't in Arizona. That was actually at a community college in uh, um, outside of San Francisco, I think. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, it wasn't I in totally Arizona. Carried it wrong. Am I? Well, thank you then for no, the correction. No, that, that's fine. Um, um, it, it's one of those things I've, I've researched, you know, uh, for the for the book. But but yeah, that's the one where you've probably seen some pictures where it's kind of at a jutted an angle, and they've got right. it lit. Uh, and but they brought the thing up about how the turnover at the studio and how it was not on anybody's priority list how he basically had to ask how to send it back. And they almost were like, oh, we don't care. You want we to don't worry. <laughs> you can keep it. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, <laughs> you're just, but that's that attitude. You know, it's like people don't, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll put it next to my three-foot enterprise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway. But, but yeah, those, those are individuals that are all covered um, in my book. Right. Uh, oh, where's Harvey? Where's Harvey Lynn? Harvey Lynn is the one at the bottom uh, with the uh, horn room glasses and the uh, uh, the uh, Air Force uniform uh, in the far right. There yeah. we go. Yeah. Well, thank you. Him. I never even thought to think that I didn't know what Harvey Lynn looked like. <laughs> yeah, well, there aren't really any photos out there. Um, there is one photo. Harvey that, Lynn. Yeah. Yeah, there, yeah, there, there is a one photo that um, got me started. It was in the um, the, the Vault um, Blu-ray that came out mm -hmm. a number of years ago, the Star Trek Vault Blu-ray, that in the extra materials, there is a Harvey Lynn that's uh, pictured there, but it turned out that that's his son. Uh, he had two sons. Uh, there was Dennis and then Harvey P. Lynn the third. Um, and, uh, the one that's pictured, uh, he's kind of got curly hair, uh, in the, in the Blu-ray is his son, but they, they noted as, as being Harvey Lynn from Star Trek, but well, it, it's see, not, you know, yeah, yeah. That's, oh. that's amazing. So, yeah, those, those, those are just some of the folks and that this I, is Stephen, uh, uh, this is Steve Poe here, Steve Whitfield. Yep. Yep. That's yeah. right. That's Stephen Poe. And then, um, some of the other individuals, let me see here. Um, who's the woman here? Oh, that's uh, Bar uh, um, Barbara Moran. She uh, worked as the assistant to um, the director of the Goddard Space Flight Center. And she was instrumental in getting Leonard Nimoy to come and speak or come to attend uh, the National Space Club's annual Goddard Memorial Dinner um, in 1967. And that launched a whole series of events, which are covered in my book, okay. that got Star Trek into the Smithsonian. It was through her efforts, really, that started this whole process that eventually wound up seven years later getting the Enterprise um, uh, the eleven foot enterprise into the Smithsonian. I should. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna back off. Well, you know, what? I was gonna. I was gonna do this originally to show the perks, and we got off on in the weeds here. But I mm -hmm. love this. Is why I, what you're doing is amazing, Glenn. And this is why I'm trying to boost it. But here's your. You were talking about the perk levels. So yep. you've got really simple. Um, really simples. Uh, yep, I've got stickers. Yeah. I've got the EMT stickers that we did. The the watching uh, prints. The signed copies of the book um the kind of the everything you know all, mm -hmm. all together we do have some copies of uh matt cushman's i think that was earlier uh cutaways from the um ships of the line calendars your your followers i'm sure mm -hmm. are familiar with that um the 2020 yes, calendar he did the center spread for the daedalus uh class um starship and the cutaway of that the one with the big ball right. you know on the front right right and um He's signed copies of that, so we will make copies of that available. And then that last one is uh, for this some. Is the one you just <laughs> added for a big splash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is one of the early uh, renderings of the Enterprise that Matt Jeffries did in pen and ink. There were a whole series of these, and this is one from my collection um, that I'm putting up um, uh, to, to help fund the, the book that uh, I purchased from Profiles in History back in 2001 when they auctioned that off when Matt was still alive. Mm -hmm. He was getting and rid of a lot of his collection, right. collections and, you know, the bridge, remember the cardboard bridge cut out? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, and he and Bob Justman. Justman, too, was involved in that and Herb Solo also. They, they started bringing out a bunch of their personal archives and making them available. Yes. So well, that's the upside down things. enterprise, which is kind of interesting. You know, you, you'll see yeah. some of those in making of Star Trek. I think there's one of them. I was going to say this series of these sketches is there. Mm -hmm. if not, if and this is the way. one, of course, where the networks and a lot of them are familiar with Star Trek printed. <laughs> the guy guy did it all the Remember time. that? <laughs> <laughs> so we all. Yeah, so <laughs> Matt Jeffries was thinking of that at one time, but but it just doesn't look right. It just doesn't quite have the balances, the iconic image right. that. We know and love right. that resulted when it's flipped over <laughs> well there's uh yeah and here's the rest of your uh you know here's your some of your stickers and pieces and some of the artwork that we've shared here i think there's some questions here from the chat if, if you're up for that sure, sure. I, will, I will curate here do you know okay. did gene roddenberry ever try to get any astronauts on star trek yes. i know we have retired ones on next generation because may jemison yep was famously uh in a star trek but um yep. No, he did. Um, Gene Roddenberry and, uh, you know, the original series, again, focusing on the original series, actually wanted to get Alan Shepard to appear on Star Trek. And I have all the documentation for that that appears in the book. 
Um, he was going to be on uh, the show uh, as a, not a regular occurring character, but uh, as an appearance, and they went so far. And this is one of the things I actually found when I was at NASA that, that kind of, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it because um, it was one of those things that really, I mean, I'm just sitting up in my chair and say, what the, you know, Alan Shepard, the first American to go into space, you know, the second person in the world to go out there um, was going to be on Star Trek. And they were actually seriously. Well, as a background dialogue. or a civilian <laughs> like or what? On some Pardon? planet or. I said as a background crew, as some civilian on some planet or. Yeah, I, I think he was just going to be as a guest uh, guest appearance, probably on one or two episodes. One, you know, definitely. And of course, he was a civil servant at that time still. Mm -hmm. And so he couldn't take any payment, you know, because obviously this was before, um, you know, he walked on the moon. <laughs> Right, right. And Apollo 14. Uh, so he was still in, uh, you know, he was still on the payroll. Uh, our tax dollars were paying. So he couldn't take any money. Um, but uh, the agreement was. And, oh, and, no, and not that. It, it, it went so not far. A hit on the budget. Poor right. Star Trek. Right. It went so far as to say, yeah, I'll, I'll appear in exchange for you doing a spot for my favorite charity. And so there was, you know, this exchange mm -hmm. going back and forth. And for some reason, um, it just didn't, uh, it didn't materialize. You know, we had to wait until uh, Enterprise appears when you, then you see Alan mm -hmm. Shepard in the, you know, introductory credits and everything. But they didn't stop there. Uh, they also went after um, Scott Carpenter, uh, no, Gordon Cooper. It was, I think it was Gordon Cooper right. that they uh tried to get uh, also. So they, they wanted a real astronaut. They wanted an NASA astronaut. And that really surprised me. You know, Alan Sh Shepard turned, well, turned it down. And so they went after another one. So there's some correspondence about trying to get this other person, you know, um, uh, Cooper on there as well. And then that didn't materialize also. So imagine if you will, if we had a real astronaut appear in our, one of our 79 episodes of Star Trek. Just the background. Whether did they get to do like a Mr. Leslie thing and say, uh, you know, good morning, sir, or something, you know, right. Or I, right. sir, do an I, sir from the helm or whatever, you know, it'd be so, amazing. Yeah. That, that, um, that, that was something that, uh, again, the NASA connection, you know, um, was, was really amazing. And, you know, when I was the historian, at the Johnson Space Center, I had access, you know, to all the archives, including, you know, all the different field centers and then NARA as well. So there's a lot of um, uh, documents that would go to the different regional facilities. That's for the, the National, National archives. archives. Yeah, the National Archives. and um, Everybody says NARA now, and it kind of like wipes Yeah, out National out. Archives yeah. and Records Administration, yeah. you know, another acronym uh, that's that like NASA. It's interesting. I mean, uh, you know, all the, all the different connections that, uh, that there are. Um, to the original series. And, and it wasn't just NASA as well. You know, the other things that I found was the aerospace community in general mm -hmm. uh, and their support for NASA. You know, I, I brought along a copy here. I think I can hold it up all right. Sure. But this is a... Um, Let me make you... Oh, yeah. This is... is it, uh, This is a copy of it's a... It's reading uh, backwards, but that's fine. Yeah, it's it, but the important thing is this, <laughs> this image here. <laughs> your, your followers will probably yes. notice there's some very familiarity here but this was from a 1960 uh proceedings that you know we had on file at the archives or in the in the nasa archives and this was one of the items that got me going as well when i saw that artwork on there i said wait a minute what's the connection here in 1960 you know when that was published mm -hmm. that certainly would be a time when you know gene roddenberry and matt jeffries and others would would be able to get access yeah. to this and then of course the models yes. that they used were models from douglas aircraft richard dayton talks about that in his book um finding the enterprise mm -hmm. the one by his the daughter. model builder for a uh, real yeah. series Bill dayton puts a out. contractor yeah so yeah. there's discarded or excess models of the enterprise or of the k7 that um, that they acquired and uh, used them for, you know, of course, the K-7. So, you know, there was another connection there. How right. did you find that, right. you know, um, find those materials? So. Uh, this is what I thought, too. We're talking about the D and Carolyn Kelly photo. Scott says, D seems the least likely of the actors to be playing with a spaceship model kit, which is what makes it fun. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm a doctor, not a model builder, you know. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, that AMT connection too. I cover that heavily in the book. Um, you know, my post that you mentioned in your one of your episodes, where I'm talking about the history of the, you know, the 55th anniversary mm -hmm. of of Star Trek, the first Enterprise model, 
And then this year being the 55th anniversary of the Klingon ship, um, the AMT connection is really important as well because that model influenced a lot of individuals, especially the enterprise. You know, mm -hmm. um, I really hit a nerve as far as um, uh, affection for sure. Star Trek when talking about the original AMT enterprise, because so many people remember that model fondly back in the days when there was very little to nurture our interest, you know, to support there our were very little NASA models. I mean, you know, the Mercury yeah. and Gemini capsules were yeah. brand new and barely out there in so, at that same time. Yeah. So in spite of all of its for, faults, you know, warts and all, um, it's still <laughs> beloved by so many, so many fans and be, being from Michigan and AMT aluminum model toy company being based in Troy, Michigan. And as a historian, um, I had a natural draw to that connection, you know, um, mm -hmm. and its contributions to, to Star Trek. So I talk quite a bit about the Stephen Poe making a Star Trek, which I still have my copy all tattered. It's just disintegrated. Oh, yeah. This is my original yeah. copy. I have it in a plastic bag here. It just falls apart. <laughs> well, I was lucky enough. You're talking about meeting people. So I'll I'll take your envy on Bob Justman. I'll envy you on Kelvin DeForest, but I uh it's up here on my shelf somewhere. I put it away. Anyway, I was on the lot and we were in LA when they were looking for for starting suddenly wanting to boost the publishing they took so long not trusting the sales numbers and then when my book and when the tech manual took off then they were suddenly running around trying to find titles and they bought herb's book with bob finally um but they brought stephen poe back you know like oh let's mm -hmm. take a sentimental favorite and he did a voyager book which is not nearly as successful right. and it brought but but stephen writes in a way like there's never an index in his books and they're not they're all over the map as far as chronology and it just drives me crazy to read it. But it was awesome to read, to meet this guy who had influenced, talk about influencing his book, you know, influenced so many people and it was in print for 30 years. I mean, it's still off and on in print, but right. getting him to autograph a copy and meet him was, yeah. a big, was a big, oh, yeah, that, yes. I mean, but that book was, you're talking about the enterprise model. It was the same, right. You know, there yeah, was sure. nothing, there was so little to get mm -hmm. that those things. And then they were so deep and foundational on top of being, you know, there was nothing. It was like having a three channel universe versus 500 cable channels. Oh, you know, it, your attention yeah. was focused. They have everybody grew up with it. Right. They have the model, you know, the enterprise model come out in 67. And then the next year to have um, the making of Star Trek, which the first printing came out in September 68, which was just basically one month before the Klingon ship came out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. And see, then, you know, the, the Klingon ship model appear on the store shelves when fans had no idea what it looked like because <laughs> the Star Trek hasn't been out yet. <laughs> that's the, see, that's the jiggery of and then what it does come out. Anything. And then when it does come out, it's it's uh, it's it's populated by Romulans. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so everyone is wondering what the heck. Although I do want to mention one really fun thing, and some some of your followers might follow this but um there was a publication called inside star trek <laughs> yes um that was put out by um lincoln enterprises it was kind of a fanzine or early fanzine that was, well, it, was it was the official newsletter right and susan was running it or yeah it yeah well yeah she job. eventually picked it up later but um in the days in 67 68 when it first came out it was still cut you know it was, it was mm -hmm. put out um during you know when the series was still being right. filmed and so they would get on set and do these articles so if you ever get a chance to get copies of those or find them on the internet they're really interesting but one of the ones that i found I, I, I would pull it out here but it was the, the it was the issue about the klingon ship um and there was a drawing of the klingon ship on the cover of this you know very crude fanzine you know it's, it's in pulp print you know how the, back in the day remember the lincoln enterprises catalogs they were printed later on right. pulp print i think they were printed in bleach print but they're very crude they're just designed to get the information out and then disintegrate and so this 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 publication came out and people are seeing this ship on there called the klingon ship and then inside of it uh dc fontana writes about it she writes a review about it and you know she's saying the kit's going to be coming out and she's describing it and how matt jeffries you know worked on it and that it was mapped you know pantograph from the original studio model so just you know uh hyping it up fantastic because it it was it was it's it's the most accurate kit you know that the early amt star trek line produced it was a wonderful wonderful kit but that drawing that was on the cover inside Enterprise, there's a little signature at the bottom that says Andy Probert. 
Andy Probert did that drawing. Wow. And, and Andy Probert, a very young Andy Probert at that time, you know, he worked at for Lincoln Enterprise. Greg Jean, of course, worked for Lincoln right. Enterprises as well. Um, and so, so there's this Andy Probert connection, you know, to having us see some of these first images of the Klingon ship. So you have the inside I Star Trek. I didn't realize that. Could get yeah, did, yeah. that. The kit comes out, then you have the making of Star Trek, and then finally Enterprise incidents come out. And then there's this whole uproar from fans saying, wait a minute, why, why isn't Wa Chang's ship on there and we have a Klingon ship? And then DC Fontana comes back later and she says, well, you know, because we're trying to promote the model kit. <laughs> Not explaining the politics about how Wa Chang's ship disappeared. <laughs> right, right, right. It was a simpler time. It was a less savvy time there. Right. You know, or, but they were sincerely, they were sincerely there. What is astrostomatology? Glenn oh. know this. <laughs> astrostomatology. That I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, one of the characters, one of the individuals that I cover in my book is a gentleman by the name of Jack Hartley. And Jack Hartley uh, worked for Brooks Aeromedical Laboratory in Texas. Uh, he was in the Air Force, and his specialty was he was a dentist. And uh, he was working on how the issue about what if an astronaut has a toothache in space, okay? You know, how, how do you take care of that? How do you respond to that? You can't just, you know, take them to the dentist and, <laughs> you know, right. you would jeopardize the whole mission. So um, he worked on a small portable kit uh, designed to basically remedy any issues that uh, astronauts or, you know, other crew members in space might have dealing with, you know, with their teeth. And uh, he followed Star Trek, and he liked Star Trek. Um, he watched it um, regularly, and when the first episode premiered, the very next day he sent a telegraph uh, to Gene Roddenberry telling him how much he enjoyed, enjoyed Star Trek. And that telegram, the original, uh, can be found in the UCLA archives, the Gene Roddenberry papers. And when I ran across that, now you know I'm, I was starting to see some documentation and others uh, with the military connection. Uh, because there was very much a military connection, you know, uh, to Star Trek as well. And so now I had some documentation that's showing individuals um, with the military being interested in Star Trek and apparently Gene Ronbeard and others thinking enough of Jack Hartley's telegram to save it, you know, to put it, put it aside and say, hey, this is important. And that telegram and some portion of that was actually quoted in uh, an ad that appeared in Variety in 1967 uh, after Star Trek was renewed, shortly after Star Trek was renewed for a second season, and they were pushing for uh, Emmy consideration, you know, with Variety. He was one of the individuals quoted in their ad uh, for Star Trek that appeared in Variety. And so I, you know, I was really curious about who this person was, and, you know, he had passed away, but... Um, his kids were still alive. And so I got to interview them and talk with them. And it turns out that um, he and Gene Roddenberry, well, I can't spill the beads too much because right, right, my book right. is in here, right? But uh, you'll learn more about it in the book, uh, the connection that he had and the influence that he had specifically with McCoy's medical pack, okay? okay. The pouch and the design of it and the elements in that. Um, so oh. you have to, you'll have to follow that in my book. My as well. gosh, Glenn, <laughs> tell me more. Are you kidding me? As a student and devotee and a research digger for years for McCoy's medical kit, because it never got, you know, right, right. Well, one, never one got any attention. The more obscure the piece, the more, the less attention it got. Well, the wonderful thing too, about, uh, being, you know, a historian, academic and researcher is there's, there's many times there's wonderful things that happen. And in the Hartley story, <laughs> That was interesting because um, I was able to, um, the family had all of his papers. Oh, awesome. Um, and they they went through a fire. There was a fire that they had, but a lot of the papers survived, including a skull, <laughs> a human skull that, that Hartley had that appeared on The Tonight Show. But that's another story because Hartley <laughs> also appeared on television back in the 1960s. Is all of this in the book? But this is all in the book. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I as much as I'm enjoying this, we should we should move on, and I don't want you to give it all away. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't expect. But, but the short end of it is, I was yeah. able to uh, put the family in touch with the National Dentistry Museum, 
which is uh, housed at the uh, University of Maryland. I didn't know that there was such a museum, but there's museums for everything, so I right. probably should know. Say. And so I was able to put the family in touch with their collection specialist so that all of his papers um, could be donated uh, to that museum. And so now they're, they will be more accessible to other researchers right. so that they can, you know, find more about Jack Hartley and his contributions to Star Trek using primary sources. <laughs> and, uh, well, did he, did he, okay. I don't want to, I started to say, did he contribute to anything else? <laughs> like, did he ever have any, okay. No, that's enough. That's enough. Yeah, no, his, his, his story is very interesting. It's just one of those surprising ones that, um, you know, I stumbled across due to that telegram. Uh, again, that mm -hmm. telegram that was found in the Roddenberry papers. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, that's one of the pleasures of researchers you know, going through these archives, you know, these stuffy old archives, looking through papers and everything, you start to make and connections. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you run across things that uh, no one has, uh, you know, encountered before. And it, it really is yeah. quite enjoyable when you do make those connections. When you find a casting list for the role of Decker for phase two or motion picture, and one of the names on it is Andrew Robinson. And you're like, what? Andy Robinson? <laughs> Red for Decker for the motion picture? Well, that's I like what was considered for, you know, April and uh, Pipe, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. But I mean, yeah. from, you find know. The, the things you find in those dusty papers. That's why I always say, guys, you know, dusty paper. History is more than dusty paper, but dusty paper is pretty amazing. Sometimes. Yeah, yeah. There, there, um, there's a lot. There is a lot out there. And, you know, it's interesting because there's been so much published on Star Trek. And I've, you know, I've read a lot and I've corresponded with others. There's a lot of people that 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 know a tremendous amount. Um, and it's one of those things Always what new material what new material are you bringing to the right. realm and so that's one thing that i'm really careful with on this book because it's like okay this is something that hasn't been touched on before yeah. and so i don't i don't want to just rehash you know stuff that's out there and and put my own spin on it this is all new material and and it's very well researched so that people will be able to find the stuff themselves they won't be able to just take my word for it they'll be able to actually trace the, here's the, the source here's the yeah here's they can the go writing. back to the no, i i thank you because that's me i it's like you know there's so much out there i don't want to pile on i always try to find the new angle or the unexamined angle or whatever and the fact that you're doing primary research and doing interviewing and finding dusty paper yeah that's you know that's so cool i'm going to limit you to a 60 second answer to this but i have to give a shout out here sure. to chris <laughs> to chris cushman oh. who was yeah oh, there you go. hi chris <laughs> there's a simple answer you can do in 30 seconds oh Why is the design oh, of the we enterprise and have a whole episode on this <laughs> well exactly. i guess what are the what are the the reasons i think that endures and um because i have a a picture well i've got the three foot one back here but i also have a large oh that's where it went you know it's been missing for years. <laughs> well, this is a picture oh <laughs> yeah okay. it was the real one right i that's i wouldn't have to postcard. worry about my funny that's the postcard that lincoln and desi lu used to send out yeah. yeah it's a black and white version of the it's three foot, but i also have a, a large print <laughs> that i actually have hung um out outside the door of my office of the of the 11 footer but you know, even with the with the AMT models, it's a design that looks beautiful in, in almost every angle. You know, um, so when you're looking at it, um, it, it it it's believable. It's it seems to to hold up so well as a design that um, uh, serves its well no matter what angle you're looking at it. It just um, and and there's been studies. There's been uh, articles written about you know the geometry of it and everything but it just holds up so well and i think your fans themselves can attest to this when they see it at the smithsonian or even haul out their old amt enterprise i've seen and psychological analyses of it back it's been a while but even talking about the feminine and the masculine in the design you know and, and all this esoteric you know right Intellectual well, you know, and, 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 and again, it was such a pioneering design too. the, you know, the scale of it, the shape of that, and, and even the uh, company and the, um, uh, the uh, advertising agency that Desilu used to help promote the original series. And this was one of my posts that I had was they issued a little cardboard enterprise uh, to send this out to their, um, to the networks and the affiliates to show them that this is the spaceship because it was so unusual, you mm -hmm. know, and they, and they printed it correctly. They didn't put it upside down. They printed it correctly because the advertising agency recognized that this ship was something special. And we all know that it's special because even at the opening of the, uh, um, every episode, you know, it's, it's, it's 
these are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. You know, it's well, it just broke the you story of it instantly future because the future had always been. It's funny now that that uh, SpaceX is launch is landing boosters on their tail fins because you know we went from the fifties models to the stacks to this you know to the Titan and the Redstone ti uh, Titan two and then the what was the one before five two. 3B, 2B. Anyway, I'm getting nerdy myself too. I'm sure. smarting myself. Anyway, sure. everything had been a stack until the space shuttle, and the space shuttle was still a stack. Mm -hmm. But this idea that it was made in space so it wouldn't need a gravity beating, you know, configuration. Right. Though, which is what people got pissed at, at the JJ movies about. Building it on Earth. Well, okay. Anyway. But the fact that it broke all those, that's what Gene wanted. He wanted something not terrestrially bound. Right. And the fact that then just artistically, the fact that it broke all those, it unticked all those boxes of what was familiar. And people, when they first saw it, on one hand had to go, that's a spaceship. Right. And, you know, but we already had the whole flying saucer mentality in our minds too from mm -hmm. UFO pop culture. So the saucer is out there, but then here's all the nacelles and pylons and, you know, aeronautical. Anyway, anyway, right. I'm, and, I'm and, waxing and, uh, here, but that's, and, that's why. When they introduced the shuttlecraft, you know, and having this small hangar bay and everything, it was just like, oh my gosh, you know, that's like uh, F4 is landing on an aircraft carrier, yeah. you know. Uh, I mean, it's 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 something that that the and you got a navy. Carrier. Well, it's air force. You can have naval flyers. But yeah, it's like the right. navy air force mishmash there. Yeah. Well, um, gosh, gosh, Glenn, this has been amazing. <laughs> oh, it's been fun. Uh, you've got some really good questions from your folks. We I have a we have a good I have a good backstage behind the scenes audience here. And yeah, business sided and all of that too. So no, and we're global, so everybody brings up brings all of that up. So anyway, so once again, uh, everybody, uh, let's let's pop it up here. This is um, inspired enterprise. Glenn's done so much other work, but his Kickstarter right now is all about this. So if you can jump over, there. I know we've had people saying that they they got on just since we since we've been on the air uh they've gone over and so you know we'll share this this will be up on our feeds if you uh, uh if you can't see the link uh but just go to kickstarter and type in inspired enterprise um and you'll find it because mine is the only inspired enterprise title of a fundraiser out there so if if you aren't or even if you're not familiar with kickstarter mm -hmm. you can just go to their web page and type that in to see it and then of course you now can... this is kickstarter so if you don't make the goal you get nothing right it's it's all or nothing yep, yeah uh at this point and i only have two weeks to go i think there's 15 days to go on it but um hey you know i appreciate the, the it, it's it's a dual promotion because you, you're promoting the book which will be out no matter what um but okay. your kickstarter funds the money that i receive will help me cover costs for these archives because travel is expensive there's three main archives that i want to visit uh to to do some more research and then of course the licensing fees that i mentioned and then whatever's left over for promotion you know to help promote the book because it's a small publisher and, and uh whatever promotion i can do but this right. being on your show certainly does help uh give me it so give me your 30 second pitch about inspired the elevator pitch for the elevator pitch for uh yes oh well uh, i'm writing a i'm writing a star trek book uh as a former nasa historian that will cover nasa's connections to star trek the original series as well as the smithsonian and other relative unknown individuals that contributed to the original series you're going to oh, see Glenn, there are so many star trek books out there is <laughs> this really a different approach a different topic Yes, yes, it is. That has not been covered, as far as I know, because I am a Star Trek fan as well, and I'm well read, and I have not really seen anything on it. And I think the advantage is because of my former connections with NASA, where I've been able to look at the archives and get access to some of this material that most people, you know, can't. Get. I just going to say between the original research, the original interviewing you're doing, some of which I'm very envious of, uh, and you've been at this for a while, and your track record, people seeing you with the 55. Uh, Enterprise model kit anniversary mm -hmm. and cling on again. No, it's an amazing topic. And I, and everybody really needs to, it's, it is a totally unexplored area or, or a lot of dots laying out there that have not been connected, much less exposed. So I uh, know it's an awesome project. Yeah, I think it'll, it'll make even the, the diehard fans appreciate even more the original series contributions and, and how 
all of these other entities and these agencies were influential, you know, in shaping the image of Star Trek because all these other individuals did work behind the scenes, ones that you just don't know about. It's like, oh my gosh, who was this person? You know, what did he look like? Well, finding what faces to the names was a big gift, but no, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, again, that mutual love affair between NASA and Star Trek was right. there. It was baked in the cake. It was in the DNA. And they yeah. really needed that, especially after the mm -hmm. Apollo 1 fire, you know, that occurred mm -hmm. in 1967. And so, you know, yeah. Star Trek was being renewed. Midway through season one yeah in 67 68 in fact uh, you know the the haunting thing i remember is that uh star trek the original series was on um uh, th uh thursday. thursday nights thursday nights right mm -hmm. um and Still the third season yeah uh the 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 day before um the apollo one fire um was aired the episode tomorrow's yesterday you know the one with uh oh wow i never made that connection mm -hmm. right the air force pilot yeah they're the back, in time. Going back and yeah. so there's this classic scene with him on the bridge in his orange jumpsuit you know and he's talking to a whore and so forth and uh there's also a classic photo of roger b chaffee in a very similar orange suit and Roger B. Chaffee, of course, was killed um, as one of the Apollo one, one crew members. So it's it's kind of this haunting thing uh, where you know this accident occurred, this episode talking about you know a young pilot um, and getting aboard the Enterprise, and then the whole period of time where NASA is trying to recover during this time, mm -hmm. and individuals um, watching Star Trek, knowing that we get through this. Okay, we have to get through this to move on because Kirk talks about, you know, what if we stopped at the Apollo program? Remember his classic speech? Oh, in, yes. uh, risk is our business in return right. to tomorrow. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. That wonderful speech, you know, risk is our business, you know, risk is our business. And so, you know, I even get choked up even recalling all of that mm -hmm. because NASA had this, NASA needed Star Trek and Star Trek needed NASA. Yes, NASA. And so there's this wonderful symbiosis, you know, going on mm -hmm. during that period of time uh, in 67, 68. So, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I can't wait for best of luck with everything with the uh, Kickstarter. Great. Um, yes. And um, and uh, everybody go support. This is amazing. If there's ever been anything worth uh, supporting in recent time, this is there's a lot of good projects out there, but uh, this is certainly one of them. So, Glenn, thanks a lot for coming on and sharing right, and um, making me smile and making my 12 year old NASA kid <laughs> come, come through, <laughs> you know, or my eight year old NASA kid, maybe even. Uh, but thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Thank you to Glenn. Once again, everybody go support as you can. I think that'll do us. That will do us for today, everybody. So things coming up. I do want to remind, I've got a couple of things coming on here in Trekland that I do want to uh, remind you about. Uh, had a great time last night. For one thing, the recording is up, but last night I was uh, over on Mission Log Live and we talked about uh, Strange New Worlds debuting this week. Yay. Everybody's excited about that. People just, uh, the the New Yorkers had their premiere event. Uh, Glenn was mentioning Wonderfest, which has come on the radar, especially every more, more and more these last few years as a wonderful model makers, model builders convention, but, you know, celebration of things there in Louisville, Kentucky. But coming up Saturday, virtually for the entire world, my friend Chris Smith, who has a unique connection with DeForest and Carolyn Kennedy, um, <laughs> Carolyn, Carolyn McC uh, Kelly, can I sit? Can I talk? So this Saturday on her new podcast, Ever Near, it's called D-Day, Remembering DeForest Kelly, June 17th. That's this Saturday at 1030 Pacific. So 130 Eastern on the Twitch channel for NBD Media. Go. Uh, Mike and Denise Akuda, my Dan Madsen, my old boss with the fan club, um, <clears throat> myself. <clears throat> some fans who other people who have been and i'm leaving out lots of names uh it's an hour live talking about deforce kelly the impact of him the impact of mccoy's character and just remembering some fun things everybody's going to bring their their memory banks and boxes this is the anniversary month of d's passing he passed on june 11th uh the last year was not a great one his final year june 11th uh 99 and I'm sure people have a lot of uplifting stories and some, you know, and Carolyn, who had had a muscular disease that he had been caring for, actually outlived Dee, which was, you know, tragic in itself because she needed caretaking help too. But they were such a lovely couple, uh, very private. Anyway, that'll that's a great thing happening at 1030 Live, 1030 Pacific, 130 Eastern, do the math for our friends around the world. That's this 
Saturday. All right. The other thing I need to mention that I have been neglecting is I'm really excited, really excited for my old stomping grounds. Nothing old about it, though. SoonerCon is in its 31, 31st edition. The guest lineup is as great as ever. John Scalzi, my friend Kevin Dilmore. We're finally doing a convention for the first time in, I don't know, 10 or 12 years together. Kevin, who, you know, co-writes with uh, Dayton, Dayton Ward. Um, Dayton would have come there, but he had a family. Uh, it's, I know. But uh, Kevin also the last few years, over a decade, working at Hallmark as their in-house uh, writer and support person for Star Trek properties, you know, from the ornaments on down. I do a recap with Kev uh, at Comic-Con, if not Vegas, every year when we have conventions. So I'm really looking forward to that live. And it's also going to be the convention premiere of Cadet Alice. We're going to take it very easy. But we're gonna we're gonna have some fun with that in the kids programming room, I should say. So that is June thirtieth, July first and second, the last weekend technically of June. There in Norman, Oklahoma, back home for me, Greater Oklahoma City on the south side, right off I thirty five, Embassy Suites Hotel, SoonerCon.com. There's still the early bird pricing available. It's in a really good spot for access. Huge parking for daytimers. It's really you're getting Texas. Kansas, Missouri, Arkansas, Colorado, which really, SoonerCon's really turned into a, a big regional convention. It's old school and yet very modern. I'll just say that. It's a hotel con that's got everything, anime, cosplay, all the things. Um, and we have a lot of fun. And I'm having a lot of fun because of back home peeps. And my other half, <laughs> the assistant group coordinator, J. Kelly Burke, is going to be with me this year. And uh, Cadet Alice, too. So we're having a lot of fun. SoonerCon.com, if you're in the region, make plans to go if you hadn't thought about it. Even though they have people from the East Coast and West Coast coming in, too. Um, great, great lineup of guests. Billy West, the voice of Bart Simpson, is another. It's not even in that graphic. They have a ton of voice actors and anime folks and cosplayers going to be there, too. Check it out. That's that. This is Saturday. Check out the uh, tape last night from Mission Log Live when you get a chance. That was awesome. Bernadette Croft, who was the costume designer from Picard, who was making one of her first baby steps into live interviewing. I think we, I think I helped win her over to the field. So I even, I even hooked her up to be a Portal 47 guest down the line. So that's been awesome. So we continue to live in amazing times. Everything from the next season of Strange New Worlds coming to people like Glenn. Is there anything new to talk about in old Star Trek? Are you kidding? Everything is new in Star Trek. Thanks to you guys for being here. And I need to say, before we totally leave the thing, thanks as we're doing here. Thanks for all of our Patreon folk helping me out. So thank you all, our TTL club, uh, Diana Hopkins, Robin Wilson, Lawrence Todd, and Marie Siegel, Justin Porteous, Galinda Bruton, Chris Jiggins, Pranakasha Productions, Comedy Forecast, and Andrew Jasimski. And our live wires, Robert McLean, Byron Bailey, J.R. Poole, Javier Gunn Johnson, Alan Ohensi. I'm getting choked up. Dave Gregory, Tobias Rex, Donna S. Runyon, and Casey Shafsky. That was an hour and a half interview, gang. I feel like it's a long Portal 47 night. Um, thank you. Thank you all so much. If you want to help out with, the, with, the, with my Patreon, we're getting into the month. They do this once a month, the way I have it set up. $5. 10 bucks, very simple. Uh, you know, Glenn had a really simple Kickstarter level system. Didn't get into a million perks. Mine is just to patreon.com slash Trekland Live. Love it if you can go over and help support where we're, what we're doing these days. Um, and of course, it's summer. We are in summer. If you're coming this way, or even if you hadn't thought about it, come out to LA, do a Trekland trek with me. We'll get to four amazing location sites for Star Trek that you custom design yourself. We'll have a fast food lunch. I will pick you up, take you back to your hotel or wherever you are here in greater SoCal. We'll work it out ahead of time. Treklandtreks.com if you can. And if it's Tuesday, that means it's a new Trek Files also over at Roddenberry. Over at our Facebook page, we have the docs this week. You want to see it. It's our once a year trip back into the fan mail, the mailbag from the 70s. And this time we've got more of the kids' letters to Gene. It's a hoot. It's a lot of fun. Uh, John Champion himself is my fan mail guest, so we have a lot of fun diving into that. Check that out at our Facebook page or wherever 
fine podcasts are caught. Of course, we, I was laughing. We were laughing about merch. All our merch is at the Tea Public store. The links of all this are at my site. Get on my mail list if you haven't done that. I'm behind to get out a newsletter and a new uh, flash poll for fans. I've got some ideas. It's the launch of a new season of Strange New. It's Emmy voting season. <laughs> the FYCs. I think the corporate money is leaning more on Picard than on any of the other series. So that's that's not a bad thing, Mary. We'll see what's up with that. And of course, the writer strike continues. The actors that SAG after their negotiations are ongoing. Their contract is up the end of June. Will there be an actors? Will there be a double whammy strike set up with actors and writers? We will see. We will see. Meanwhile, next week, we'll be back with another Trekland Tuesdays Live. We will be jiggering around a little bit the last week of the month while I'm in Oklahoma. We'll see how that goes. But meanwhile, I'm so glad you all are here. Thank you for your support. The Patreon, just being here, throwing in with the chat. It was great to have Glenn and his entire family and Skippy, too. Uh, with us today. So as I leave you guys, gals, peeps, just please, please uh, stay healthy. Do all the things. Stay woke. Check the sources. And yeah, trek well, everybody. <laughs>